Well, good morning, everyone, and happy April Fool's Day, mm -hmm. 2023, April 1st. <laughs> we are very honored today to have as our speaker, Dr. Um, Peter Nodge, mm -hmm. and it's spelled N-A-G-Y, who mm -hmm. is an expert on Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and its rhetorical functions in society. So without much more ado, I guess I will get rid of our... Um, our logo here, so we can be back to our regular view. And I will, oh, I'll give a couple more credits for Dr. Nodge. He is the head, is this correct? The Center for Science and the Imagination? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Not anymore. Uh, Not I used anymore? to work there um, okay. at University College, which is still Arizona State University, but it's a different unit. Okay, well, maybe the unit, I'll, I'll let you introduce which unit you're with, and it's at mm -hmm. Arizona State University. And for those who don't live in the United States or in Arizona, this is in Phoenix or Tempe, mm -hmm. Arizona. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know what else. Let's see. I have known Dr. Nodge for just a few weeks, but I was very impressed with his um, track record of publishing several essays on the rhetorical functions of Mary Frick. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And just to, for those who are not in the field of communications or rhetoric, what we mean by the rhetorical function is not what conditions were in 1818, not what the um, text actually says, although that is being used. It's how the text is used in society in current times. You know, what, what meanings are ascribed to this text and what directive um, actions does this text produce in the audience that are viewing or reading the text. If you're reading it, it's still 1818. If you're viewing it, it's a very different ballgame. So when you translate something from a novel, you know, to a, and I won't take up any of Peter's talking points, but I, I felt I should frame this because some people viewing this may not be in the field of communications. Okay, mm -hmm. take it over, Peter. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, so wait, wait, yeah. one other one other thing. Please um, turn off your cell phones. I forgot to mention this, Peter. I'm sorry. Turn off your cell phones. Turn off your mics, and turn off your video during the content of this talk. Thank you. So good morning, and thank you so much for having me here. Um, I am Dr. Peter Naj, and I work at Arizona State University, and I was part of the Frankenstein Bicentennial Projects project because we celebrated uh, the 200th um, year anniversary of May Shea's Frankenstein. And for that, um, at the Center for Science and the Imagination, um, we um, worked with a lot of scientists, engineers, and designers to create <clears throat> art form, arts, um, art exhibitions and different games and also activities so people can um, understand, get a better understanding of um, the enduring impact and legacy of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So for this presentation, I, I thought we would revisit the <clears throat> history of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And I think that would help us understand why we have this visceral and very negative reaction to the word Frankenstein when we hear that today. So um, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein came from a dream. So if you're familiar with the, uh, with the history, um, the um, Lord Byron and, and Mary Shelley and um, her husband, Percy, uh, were invited to um, a home in Geneva and they had a horror writing contest. And um, a lot of people tried to come up with a story and Mary Shelley was struggling to come up with um, an original story. But then she had this dream and I used this from her memoir that um, she saw a pale student and she saw this, um, this horrifying image when um, this man, um, work with something mysterious and then almost like he was able to resurrect the dead or create a life it was mostly like a ghostly hand uh, that's what she saw in her dream and that gave her um 
an inspiration to, to write this story, to start working on the story in 1816. So um, the original text was published in 1818, uh, but then, um, and I'm going to talk about the original text, I'm going to focus on that one, but it's important to acknowledge that there, were, there was a reprint in 1823 that um, had more than 100 edits, some of them were more substantial, some of them were just minor edits, but the big one was 18, uh, in 1831, and Percy Shelley's, um, that contained Percy Shelley's edits. Unfortunately, that one is, I think, a little bit more popular and more used, at least here in the US, than the original text. Uh, and that was a completely different story. So um, Mary Shelley's story, and I'm going to talk about it in a second, uh, was more about science and, and um, ethics. And the 1831 edition was more like a Gothic horror story. Um, it was not about scientists. Uh, well, we'll talk about that. That work didn't exist that time, though. Uh, but it wasn't about Victor Frankenstein. It was more about a horror so uh, a supernatural horror uh, novel, if you will. So we can already see here that the original intent and content was lost um, pretty early on. So what makes the story, the original story, uh, so unique? Um, <clears throat> well, first it was published in three volumes and each volume contained a different perspective. So um, the the first story is about Victor Frankenstein and, and his perspective, then the creature's perspective, and then Captain Walton, who finds um, a dying Victor Frankenstein in the uh, Arctic. Um, that's his recount of the story. Um, <clears throat> actually, it starts with Captain Walton finding Victor, but shortly after we, we um, learn more about Victor Frankenstein. So here, he was a chemist, maybe, we don't know, uh, or a scholar. Um, but again, the word scientist didn't exist at time. It was invented um, 14 years later um, in the UK. So Victor was presented like a scholar who was interested in a lot of different um, issues, mostly about the, the boundaries between life and death. And he might, have used electricity or not, we don't know, because the text is pretty vague there, to create um, the creature. Um, and then um, he immediately abandons the creature. So the creature runs away. We don't know what happens to him, uh, to it or him, uh, creature. Um, it's often referred to him, although he, although Mary Shelley never used the pronoun there. And then, um, Later, we learned that the creature didn't know what to do uh, and uh, tried to observe um, other humans to learn more about culture. So he was able to learn language and interact with people. But then he looked so hideous that uh, nobody really wanted to, to be around him. So he got lonely and he revisits Victor. He goes back to Victor demanding that um, you created a, a monster, and um, um, I'm forever alone. Uh, at least uh, create uh, create a companion for me. And Victor first refuses it, but then later he almost <laughs> creates a companion. But then the last minute he decides not to do that. So the creature um, seeks vengeance and actually kills uh, Victor's uh, bride, and then Victor starts chasing then a creature and the uh, Arctic, they face each other. And that leads to Victor's death. Um, although he's dying, but Captain Walton finds him and they talk um, about what happened. And uh, we don't know if the creature died, probably, but probably didn't. So we're not really sure what happened to the creature. So that's the essence of the story. Of course, I um, try to be uh, mindful about time, so didn't go into details, but this this is the, the main arc of the story. And again, the uniqueness is the three different narratives that feed into each other. And if you read the original text, you see that Victor was um, first portrayed as a passionate, curious, ambitious 
uh, scholar, and later he became obsessed with this um, mission or project of his, the creating some sort of life. So again, the story is uh, Victor obsessed with his project, trying to create something unique, which he's able to do, but then abandons the creature. And then that's the main um, um, scene when the creator and the creature face each other. And um, that was the original story that leads to uh, Victor Frankenstein's death. Um, but of course, we know that that's not what the public thinks of uh, Frankenstein and the story. So um, it's important to acknowledge that there were a lot of lots of um, adaptations and iterations of the original story. Um, even in the in 19th century, there was already an infamous play um, just five years later, the original publication. So in 1823, uh, that was a completely different story than what um, uh, Mary Shelley wrote. And that was already more like a spectacle and was more about um, uh, new, adding more characters to the story. And it was again, a very different story than what um, um, Mary Shelley wrote. But we didn't have to wait too long to uh, just get into the 20th century to have uh, a lot of movies, including the first Frankenstein movie in 1910. And of course, video games, comics, um, and even um, new adaptations of Frankenstein. So I took a look at um, the Wikipedia page of um, the different Frankenstein movies and just in, in the 20th century and early 21st century, I think we have over 80 different movies, Frankenstein. So almost every year there was some sort of Frankenstein movie. Maybe it's a short story, um, just a cartoon, or maybe it's just mentioning the character Frankenstein. But again, there were lots of lots of stories. But that doesn't stop there because we had, you know, um, different candies, uh, Halloween costumes, and so forth. So Frankenstein is everywhere, and yet um, nobody really knows what the original story is about because there are so many adaptations that create some sort of um, shared misunderstanding of the story. So that's why um, the cultural theorist uh, attorney says that we are never going to get rid of the Frankenstein story. It's so deeply embedded in our Western Anglophone culture that um, we will always, always remember it and use it especially when we discuss our attitude to science and scientists. So why is it? Um, because of these adaptations and because of these different retellings of the story and changing into a very different narrative what, uh, than what uh, Mary uh, Shelley created, it became a mythical story. And we know from cultural studies that uh, mythical stories are part of our culture and they serve as an important device to make sense of the world, especially um, of things that we cannot really explain. In the past, um, in the olden days, that was weather and uh, different animals. Nowadays, it's more about uh, a lot of things that are around us, but we cannot really see how they work, namely science and also technology. So, if we take a look at the Frankenstein myth, and I'm going to use myth here because again, it's it's a shared understanding of the Frankenstein story, story but it it hold, well, it has some sort of traces of Mary Shelley's work, but it's more about um, um, a mishmash between different retellings of the story. But if we focus on the um, Frankenstein myth, there are five important um, dimensions of this myth. One is about unlocking secret knowledge. So scientists and inventors, inventors and engineers, they all want to learn something new and, um, and um, break the rules of nature so they can create something unique. 
Um, and that's again, um, it, we already know that from uh, mythical stories like Prometheus, right? Uh, in the Greek mythology, it was already a figure of that, a Titan who stole fire from the gods. So people can uh, use fire uh, on earth so they don't have to be cold anymore. Um, then um, it's also the second dimension is also very important that we want to tr transcend human uh, weaknesses. So um, it's not just about unlocking secret knowledge, it's also about improving our conditions. Again, if you think about Promethe Prometheus, the fire. Here in the Frankenstein story, it's about, or the myth, it's more about um, crossing the boundaries between life and death. And that leads us to the uh, third um, dimension. It's not just about uh, crossing those boundaries, but also manipulating that and creating, manipulating life and creating life. Um, in the story, of course, it was Frankenstein's creature that many people think that Frankenstein is uh, the creature, but the creature never had a name. Um, it was just called a creature. So um, the, and the third and the fourth um, um, dimensions are more about controlling and trying to regulate science. So these are great things that scientists or engineers um, can do, but it's also important, and that's one message from uh, warning, if you will, from the Frankenstein story that we need to regulate this creativity. Asking questions are um, is important, but when you have, want to engage in certain um, scientific or engineering practices, you have to make sure that doesn't cause any harm. Namely, in the story, the creature, well, according to popular understanding, the creature goes to the village, and then kills people and the villagers are holding uh, pitchforks and, and torches and they, um, and that was in the movie, of course, um, that has nothing to do with the novel, but they chase down and, and, and kill the creature. So if we want to avoid it, we have to make sure that we regulate this uh, scientific uh, creativity. And the, the fourth, uh, fifth one, and that, that will explain so much about why we feel about Frankenstein the way we do in the present, that we have to resist scientific ambition. Some questions are just too dangerous to ask and some practices are too dangerous to, to try out in real world. And, um, and that's probably um, the, the fifth one that will help us understand why people feel that, um, negatively about certain practices that I'm going to talk about in a minute. So if we take a look at the myth as a, story, as a whole, these are the five key messages of, of the myth. Um, and if we want to boil it down to one specific uh, sentence is that scientists are too ambitious, they are cut off real world, and um, their passion and their work can create dangerous monsters if we don't. Um, do something about it. So if you take a look at popular culture in the US, we can see Frankenstein is seemingly everywhere. You can just have to use Franken and add something and then it will lead to um, a very vivid, vivid and visceral reaction, um, mostly about manipulating life, right? So Franken food, right? When you genetically modify some sort of um, uh, uh, crops or meat and then um, that's um, that was the first image I found on Google. If you Google it, um, immediately they put uh, the creature there that they call Frankenstein for some reason, and then they use uh, really disgusting images there. But then there are, there are other stories when we use or journalists and um, uh, public speakers use Frankenstein um, when they talk about hybrids, cloning, or combining human and animal cells uh, immediately evokes this image that Victor Frankenstein was tinkering with life, right, and death, and that was a big that led to so much suffering. And nowadays, it's more about artificial intelligence and robots and uh, androids. So again, um, it's the same story, but applying to a different context, namely technology. Again, something that we cannot explain because we don't know how they work. So um, the Frankenstein myth provides us vivid images so we can better understand and misunderstand um, this, um, um, these inventions. 
So um, if you do a quick search, you will find these images of Frankenstein AI, Frankenstein robot, and um, Frankenstein monster also as robots. So different variations, but you will find a lot of these different devices, uh, narrative, um, or I'm, I would say re re rhetoric devices that they use. And um, now uh, getting to uh, COVID, uh, I was not surprised, uh, maybe you were not surprised either that they will use Frankenstein for uh, COVID to, to describe COVID. So uh, they use the Franken economy uh, um, to describe the post-pandemic uh, post world. And um, because of the nature and the, all those conspiracy theories around uh, the origin of COVID, people had this image that it was invented or unleashed from a lab in Wuhan, uh, China. And people came up with this idea that scientists were tinkering with dangerous viruses and then it, something bad happened or maybe they intentionally released it depending on what conspiracy theory you are reading. And that led to so much suffering. Um, again, we go back here manipulating life um, although viruses are not alive or we don't fully, right? So um, based on my understanding of biology, we don't know whether they are alive, but they are not really. But for this myth, it's like, oh, it's a living thing that you can manipulate. And um, it involves tinkering, stitching, and so forth. Again, very vivid images from Frankenstein, uh, from the Frankenstein story. Um, and um, we, um, and at the Center for Science and Imagination, we did a lot of interviews with different scientists um, in working um, the fields of engineering, computer science, biology. And I use this quote from a scientist when I asked uh, him about different um, interpretations of Frankenstein. He said that, oh, um, I he loved this book, um, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And um, he loved that passion that Victor Frankenstein embodied. And when he worked uh, on his dissertation, he actually had a journal um, like Victor Frankenstein had. And uh, he took a great deal of inspiration. So when he details how much um, he adored um, the passion that Victor Frankenstein had. On the other hand, however, it's important that he had also acknowledged that um, he um, broke the rules and so, there's something really bad. Here, um, it was interesting to see that these scientists read the original story, um, Mary Shelley's uh, original novel, yet when they were talking about the story, they immediately started using images and story arcs from the movies and other adaptations. Um, they didn't even um, notice that they were not talking about the original novel, but they were talking about the the movies. So that was interesting to see because it again showed us that when we think we know the original story, we actually don't. <laughs> we probably remember some sort of um, um, another story or another or story arc from a totally different adaptation. And because it's they are surrounding us, we don't even notice that, oh, I actually, I'm not talking about a novel anymore. I'm talking about the Frankenstein myth. So um, what I think is important, um, and that's what we found in the interviews and also when we did this research, that so many scientists are afraid of using Frankenstein, the word, they try to avoid it. They try to create presentations and, uh, and do public speaking when they were very particular and, uh, and careful with their words because they know if they do work related to artificial intelligence or um, different types of um, biological work or medical work, people, some people will bring up Frankenstein. But what I would argue is that they should embrace rather than denying uh, the Frankenstein image because they know it's going to happen and it's not really worth hiding from it. It's more important to go um, well, be up upfront uh, with this image and all, all, all the connotations that it brings. Uh, it brings, and that would actually help us overcome the stigma that um, Frankenstein brings to scientists, certain scientists, and certain um, engineers' work. Um, and uh, the more they are afraid, uh, the more likely it's going to happen. 
So um, that was interesting to see how much they tried to avoid um, anything that would bring Frankenstein to the big picture. And if we go back um, to, um, again, the original story, Mary Shelley was concerned because of her also traumatic experience with childbirth, um, because she lost her <clears throat> child um, during um, when she was giving birth. Uh, she was concerned of so many things that were um, people witnessing in the 19th century. Um, probably not intentionally, but she created a narrative also those adaptations, of course, um, um, created a different narrative what, that what, what she created originally that were, could be used to understand science. What she was focusing on is electricity in the novel, right? Oxygen and, um, and um, a little bit of chemistry too. Um, there she was concerned that people can be brought back from death there were um, stages where scient scientists, well, again, uh, that word doesn't exist at the time, scholars were using electricity to do certain magical tricks in front of people, and that was traumatizing. Um, <clears throat> seeing that electricity can move uh, certain body parts, or oxygen when people were being executed in front of other people, or suffocating and, and dying or seeing and witnessing that um, different chemicals can be used to, to create certain uh, effects. And uh, all these images are so ingrained in our you know, imagination because of all these different adaptations that we, well, scientists try to distance themselves so badly and deny this as much as possible. And yet again, um, because it's a, well, it's over 200 years old, um, we should stop running from this story and we should just talk about it, what this story really means. And, um, and that would be it. And thank you so much. And then, of course, we can have a discussion about it. So I still have a lot of time. Um, thank you, Peter. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm going to give my own little presentation just for a couple minutes from the rhetorical perspective. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to have some slides, but I don't mm -hmm. have them. So I'll just put a couple key words into chat. And let's see, one of them is cynic doki, which maybe people not in the communications fields may not know. And cynic doki in literature can be something like um, Shylock. where this is where one figure, as you say, becomes mythic and iconic in culture and represents a whole um, group, whether of people or whether of people doing a certain activity. And I think embracing Shylock would be going a bit far because <laughs> it's far more negative than positive in Shakespeare. Uh, we can look at all the sides of Shylock, but it is generally when it's used, not in literature, but used as a, let me see if I got this rhetorical function. This synecdoche is used by people who are not being judged in order to judge others. And it, what it, when you uh, demonize or use a synecdoche, that means that you're essentializing. Here's another, I know a lot of people hate it with these words, but essentializing a group of people is where you say all so-and-sos do such and such. And that means that all, um, I'll use the Shylock, all Jewish people are money lenders and they take advantage of people. So that would be using a synecdoche in a demonizing way and essentializing the group category of Jewish people. Um, so when you use Shylock or Frankenstein as a synecdoche or as a demonized image, it has a directive function when it's used rhetorically against either a group of people of one sort or another, in this case, against people who, who view the world 
using the, the type of eyes that you use, the, the type of thinking that you use in scientific method, and what would we replace it with in a complete um, subjectivity? Because scientific method was actually created in order to counteract an extreme subjectivity where whatever we think or a powerful person in our tribe thinks, we all think, and there's no way to check it. There's no way to you know, assess those impressions. So when you essentialize science this way, it means that there are not individual fields of science. There are not individual scientists. There is science, which we have to do something about. And when you have a Shylock, you know, it's Shylock needs to be contained. He's a dangerous figure. And, and these are the dangers of the rhetorical uses that it's nice to know all these different versions of Shelley's Frankenstein. And to some degree, I wouldn't say embrace, I would say understand it and learn the different versions. I would never embrace Frankenstein personally uh, because of this very powerful use of synecdoche where one negative figure represents all. And certainly you can criticize science, you can have, there are regulations and you could add more regulations to science and laws that, uh, that scientists should not break. But looking at science as uniquely dangerous and say religion as uniquely positive, there are just as many dangers in, in other fields or, you know, it's, it's, you have to look at everything. There are, there are dangers and there are positive aspects because any kind of an abstraction is made up of real human beings. And that's what gets lost when you turn uh, human beings and their varying ways of using, re whether it's uh, religious spirituality or nationalism or science or imperialism or whatever, um, especially as it turns toward the political, then you can have one figure represent a vast, diverse, varied, complex, textured group of things. And uh, that's what people in rhetoric are aware of these things. They may take different positions about science and about Frankenstein, but they are aware of the power of the synecdoche and what that can do to the attitudes toward subjectivity, which is much more favored in the humanities. In the humanities, the goal is to be as subjective as you possibly can. And there are some who even deny the possibility of being objective. And so in, in doing so, they are essentially saying science should not exist because it's an impossible goal and only um, subjectivity of the humanities should be uh, fostered and uh, encouraged. So it all depends on how much faith we have in our own subjectivity. And that I would say that it's more of what, what should be controlled is extreme subjectivity and extreme attempts at objectivity which includes scientific curiosity. So they're both extremes, but you don't get that out of the image of Frankenstein. It's a very one-sided argument against the objectivity and the curiosity of science. And there is no critique of the subjectivity and the dangers of extreme subjectivity with no um, objective measurements to counter it. And that's why, I hope everybody's getting to the where I'm going, that's why we have so many conspiracy theories that we are unable to say anything to because people have become enmeshed in, in all of the rhetoric of extreme self-justifying, self-righteous subjectivity. And much of it is directed against science because science would give a, a counter way of viewing these subjective um, conspiracy theories and various other things. So basically that's, that's coming from a more rhetorical use of this text than a history. And uh, it used to be thought that the main reason we study literature is to find out what the writer intended or the composer or the artist. Now, because we know readers do not come to these texts as blank slates, we have to look at what are readers doing with these texts? How, what do their life experiences make them see in a text or not see? 
the person reading Frankenstein sitting next to me probably won't get the same things out of Frankenstein that I do because that person may have totally different experiences. And this is what's driving some of this energy behind revivals of Frankenstein. It's the experiences, what people have read, what they've seen that are driving them to feel profound uh, passions. And I think one thing is the link with between science and weapons. And that didn't come up because, I mean, literally um, Frankenstein is about creation of life. That's only the literal denotational meaning of, of the novel Frankenstein. Rhetorically, it's used for every dangerous thing that science as a metaphor has created, not just the literal being, biological being, but everything, every dangerous thing that scientists haven't been involved with is up and given a big spotlight when people use Frankenstein. So they, they also may have a, an animus against science because of the creation of the atomic bomb. And this has to be not totally embraced because not every scientist worked in those fields. And again, when you essentialize the word science, then all scientists are guilty of that. And, and so these are various aspects that I think need to be considered because yes, we need to look at science, whatever that means as an abstract concept, but also be aware that it is possible to oppose objectivity and oppose the way of countering extreme subjective things in the humanities, which include the spirituality movements and various other alternative sources of information that are out there on the internet. Objectivity has some really stiff rules about that. It rules that you have to have peer, um, peer, peer edited journals and things where people have tested um, hypotheses over many trials. And there's a lot of um, misuse of these things, but, but that is the counter to extreme subjectivity where because I think it, it has to be true and I found five other people and we voted on it, therefore there are ghosts and there's no way we'll get rid of you if you question ghosts. I see we have a hand here. Okay, Tim. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Peter, for uh, um, an interesting um, uh, presentation. I learned uh, actually a few things that I did not know and they were very inspiring. Thank you. Um, I, 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 I will take a different tack than Gloria's uh, uh, commentary. I have always been interested in the, the mechanism of these scientists, whether in their labs, in their academia, that, that, that the, you know, you mentioned the elements of ambition one of the five issue, five points in your mythical thing. And um, I've always felt, what are these, what are the elements of the ambition, the ambitiousness that these scientists, what's the drive a bit behind uh, the, their work? Um, and this is one of the interests. And then what are the elements that they dismiss the untoward effects is it, is it because uh, they have no idea, they are enclosed, I think you mentioned in their own uh, bubble or world, and, um, and they dismiss all the consequences of their work. This is not the criticism of science per se, a gen it's not a general criticism, but we've reached a point in science that our in, in, interference or the scientists' interference or discoveries or, or you know, economic uh, rewards are so fraught with so much, you know, dangerous consequences that you cannot uh, undo the stuff, like, you know, genetic modification, like, you know, the gene therapies, which also the you know the vaccine gene therapies, um, a lot of that. So is it what, what's the elements? I believe you know one of the reasons, but I this is just one thought, is the lack of humanities 
studies and the separation of humanities from the science. So the they, they scientists are completely, lack of a better word, ignorant of, of the nuances of philosophy, nuances of, of literature, the, the past experiences, Prometheus, uh, you know, Icarus, uh, all that stuff. So, Um, uh, Peter, did you want to comment? Are yes, you... yes, yes, um, yes. And I also want to clarify my point uh, embracing rather than denying, because that's my understanding of uh, Victor Frankenstein, again, subjective, of course, that it's less about um, what um, the original intention of Victor Frankenstein was. It's more about taking care of our inventions and not abandoning um, our creations. So being uh, considerate and following strong ethical principles. And that's what the original story is about, that when you don't do that, that's when things go wrong. And, uh, we, and, and, and I think uh, I agree with him in a way that in a lot of uh, scientific disciplines, because they have to, when students start their um, major in biology or in other sciences, they have so many subjects to complete that they often don't really take classes in humanities. And uh, in, in life sciences, there is this strong um, um, public perception that's objective, uh, there's no agenda and it's always like you can um, when you do an experiment the experiment will look exactly the same if you do it a week later or two weeks later which they're absolutely not true of course <laughs> but um, I think um, in a lot of ways when we don't want to talk about Frankenstein that's when we invite people to start the conversation and um, and then we have to defend our our position um, because because it's weaponized, like you said, Gloria. Absolutely, it's it's it can be used in so many different ways to discredit scientists and scientific work. Um, but in many ways, I think um, if we had more classes um, in 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 um, literature and in ethics and and cultural studies, I think people would have more especially those scientists would have more opportunities to to um you know reflect upon the different dimensions of frankenstein and um the last point um uh, is that i think um it's also important to acknowledge the fact that the novel is pretty vague um in the original novel and how uh, victor created life and, and we know from social sciences and psychology in particular that the more um the less specific a narrative is, the more likely uh, it can be used in, in different contexts. So because Mary da did not specify and didn't really give um, a detailed account of how Victor created the creature, it gives a, it leaves a lot to our imagination. And that that is that is a dangerous thing to do when we start. And that leads back to Gloria, your point, that it gives a lot of opportunities for people who want to um, discredit, again, I'm gonna use this for uh, scientists and scientific work. Um, so um, um, a, a narrative that has no specific details on certain things, you can add so many new dimensions without um without um so, so and people will not see that oh you actually did this because they and their understanding of the story is different than yours and the story is already very vague so that my that's my point that's another narrative the characteristic of the feature of this narrative is already very vague so it's easier to weaponize it in many ways and um, and I think um, and again going back to Tim, I'm sorry, this is the last point. Um, is that a lot of ways scientists uh, did do terrible things in the 20th century with no ethical um, guidelines, with no ethical oversight, and it's not just the atomic bomb. If you think of race science and medical ex experimentations of African American people in the U.S., those are um, one of the most 
if well, one of the most shameful uh, parts of uh, history that we still don't really talk about, by the way. So there are certain stories, but they don't really acknowledge this. So I think um, it's important to to, and I wish we had more opportunities to talk about Frankenstein and 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 people, students especially. Well, you can certainly them. come back and talk again. You know, maybe as this evolves, this um, now that they're doing an opera at the Arizona Opera in October, I, I guess I should mention that about Frankenstein. It might be timely to go early next year and talk about it again. And sorry, just the last point, and that that leads back to also who is a scientist? It's a man, a white man wearing lab coat, right? So it leads back to this image that a scientist is always a man. Um, and um, we try to uh, counter this narrative in the Frankenstein project. So we created new narratives around it. And there are great new uh, Frankenstein narratives. They're actually detailed um, and uh, give um, and highlight a lot of ethical dimensions and invent new, invite new contexts. Like what if the scientist uh, is an, an African-American woman and uh, she wants to save her son who died, uh, who, who was lost to a tragic um, accident. So there are good and great and very sen sensitive retellings of the original stories. And yet we always go back to these big stories that were pretty um, damaging for a lot of reasons. Well, I think, uh, you know, Tim also has another question or do you just still have your hand up, Tim? No, 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 that's, I'm okay. Well, then can you lower your hand, please? Do uh, you know how to do that? It's I'm just for everybody's benefit. It's you hit reactions with the uh, click reactions and then yeah, lower hand is an option. There we are. There you go. Um, I wanted to hear from others of us that we haven't heard from yet. If you have any comments, sometimes people that are talking, you know, don't remember to include. So Nancy, you've been here. Georgia, do you have comments? If they're still listening. Well, no comments from them. Um, I have something else about- I'm just, Excuse oh, me, I am, I am. I was across the room and I was listening. Um, no, I think it's very interesting that what you're saying is that when you don't write in detail, <clears throat> that is dangerous. Um, so then it becomes more mythic than most, the more general or, or the most universal, uh, then you get all this subjective interpretation. So I think that's kind of a natural, how, I, I just want to talk more about the dangerous part of it. How, how, how have you seen it be dangerous? And I, I guess you could say the atom bomb or something like that, right? <laughs> For one thing, or the misuse of, of uh, power. That, that part interested me. If you want to talk about that, I don't know. Nancy, you're on now. <laughs> yeah, what, well, in the interest of danger, I think danger also can change over time as to what we're looking at is dangerous. Now we're looking at computer software, which we wouldn't have thought of yeah, 50 years ago when I started working mm -hmm. in software. And uh, I know we had a chance to do some artificial intelligence work. Oh, you're freezing up, Nancy. Maybe if you get rid of your visual, just, just do audio for a while. I thought you were okay. I could hear or you. Maybe it's me. Maybe I'm freezing up. I thought up. she was fine. I, anyway, you. that was... Oh, I already did. Uh, Mute. Go ahead, uh, Nancy. <laughs> yeah, it's like what we're looking at and applying Frankenstein to is different. Now, I never read all that much into Frankenstein, but I hadn't realized how it had spread into so many different approaches. And I think it, it depends on who, whoever's, whoever has prejudice fits it into the Frankenstein myth. And it's easy to do. You just wanna make something look bad, you Frankenstein it. And uh, I don't know that that always makes things bad or evil or need to be controlled because I don't know that you can do that. So I don't quite know how, you know, it's nice to theoretically talk about you can do things and you can control things, but 
I don't know who publishes the rules and who can enforce the rules because I think if people are greedy or self-promoting or want to come out ahead of other people or whatever, they're going to go and do their thing, whatever it may be. And I don't think they're going to worry a whole lot about how it affects other people, unfortunately. And until we can get our hands around that or find some way of of how we can control it. I don't know what we're going to do other than talk more about it. <laughs> Same with the artificial intelligence. It's now become popular. I don't think people have any idea how this could change things. They just know it helps them with their term paper. Mm -hmm. And they'll, they'll use it for that. Mm -hmm. Not realizing that they're losing the ability to create their own term papers or come up with their own ideas. And uh, now, for all I know, the computer can come up with ways of combining things that we haven't even thought of, not because it's thinking of it, just because it combines things in different ways than we might. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. There can be some really good things there as well as really bad things. And mm -hmm. I think like other things in life, we're going to have to learn to grow with it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and I, yeah, could I raise my hand again? I just. Uh, had another thought that I was going to bring up. Okay, raising hand here. Um, I think it's important to take responsibility for your own rhetoric. And sometimes it's really good to be on a, a virtuous side. And there's a lot of that. Once, once morals and moralizing enter, it's very hard to use process thinking. And this is a danger that we I don't know if it's a danger, but just a, a habit of mind that we observe in rhetoric studies is that it's more common to view things with less um, context from the other side and more context from one's own position. So again, you know, when you have such a, a negative figure, not from the original novel, and I, I'm making a distinction how Frankenstein rhetorically functions is only vaguely connected to the, the novel. It's going, it's something different. It's a whole different animal. It's just like when you say you, not, you adapt Jane Austen to film, film students would say, well, you, it isn't the same artifact anymore. So Frankenstein as the novel is not the same artifact as the rhetorical function of Frankenstein. And because of the, the movements of feminism and other uh, postmodern theories, especially, it, it is very easy to slip into an extreme subjective position that because science is geared toward objectivity, which some in, in the humanities say isn't even possible, then get rid of science, get rid of scientific thinking, the scientific method, and there's, there's not the same kind of breaks being put on the people who advocate for these positions that we're arguing that should be put on science. And we don't know what would happen if we escaped from scientific logic, what would be irrevocable in that case. So it's, it's sort of a, a spectrum between subjectivity and objectivity, whether we really consider objectivity possible or not. One of the most objective things that was considered very positive in the 1920s was the IQ test. And in Stephen Jay Gould's uh, book, The Mismeasure of Man, that is shown to have been used against uh, various groups of undesirables, quote unquote, at Ellis Island. That's what, and it was created in World War I, but it was used that way. And if you were illiterate and you didn't even speak English, they would just test you in English and you were considered a uh, you know, retarded person. So we understand that objectivity is often flawed, but extreme subjectivity is also flawed because it puts people on a moral pedestal. Often they will involve God, spirituality, and various things that are not able to be measured. And it's very difficult to argue against people who are saying that this offends my religion. God told me to do this or whatever, it's just right, it's natural law and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, one thing that if you argue very hard against science and use a, a demonized figure like Frankenstein, 
it's really a it's really kind of a, a spectrum we're arguing between subjective ways of viewing the world and objective and whether we agree and I know the humanities sometimes says that's not even possible. We know that subjectivity is possible. Do you have any more comments on that, Peter? Yeah, I, I think um, uh, and that's also important to acknowledge that they just gonna use it, uh, the Frankenstein image to, to pursue their own agenda, right? So they just, it's, a red, uh, it's not because of Frankenstein that they think that science is bad or immoral. It's they already have this um, view and and anti-scientific view in the US. It, it's a very different kind of monster than in Europe. I come from Europe. Europe has its own anti-scientific uh, sentiments, but it's very culturally, of course, and historically different than the US, what the US has. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, you said something uh, very important here that science, um, just by saying it's science, you legitimize something that is absolutely your own uh, bias by your own, with your own views and by your own um, stereotypes and and even um, anti-Semitism or, or racism. And and the IQ test is a great example for that. But also AI is a good good example for that. How AI um, has been used to oppress people, to do surveillance, to collect data, to um, to say that oh we cannot do anything about it. AI is happening. We can't control it. It's out of the of the the genie is out of the bottle, right? We cannot put it back. Um, and um, and it's it's um, it is very interesting to see that Frankenstein is just a small puzzle piece of puzzle in this big bigger picture that how people can use powerful people a lot of money resources and a lot of uh, privilege over other people to use scientific or technological advancements to to do harm and. Um, Frankenstein keeps reminding us that um, that if we don't talk about regulation, we don't talk about responsibility, then um, science is not something that will that that there that is neutral, objective, and and uh, good. And it the context matters how we use it, who uses it, um, who benefits from it. Uh, who gets harmed by this or or receives harms by it? So, and these are interesting questions for that. That's it. The other, mm -hmm. the other side to this is what about um, where science is pilloried, you know, in pulpits and in editorials? Mm -hmm. I, I see no lack of talking about the Frankenstein. You showed many inter many incarnations of um, talking about it, but usually people use a binary, two valued system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know it's all good or it's all bad mm -hmm. and i don't think these nuances that we're hoping to get at are really coming out i don't think that uh, the scientists are the majority they're they're relatively few in number but it's the two factions of people some who are very uh, subjective and and mm -hmm. aware of things that can't be quantified that's and you know that goes back to the humanities and the sciences there there's an unspoken thing People who tend to go into the humanities often are not good at math. Mm -hmm. One tends to, to be dismissive of what one mm -hmm. isn't very proficient or, or mm -hmm. gifted in. Mm -hmm. Most of the um, ways that science is being criticized isn't even, the scientists aren't even aware of it because these two groups do not communicate. And that's what C.P. Snow was talking about in the two worlds. He said they are in their own separate mm -hmm worlds and they don't even know yeah so these are and, problems of communication as well and e english is getting defunded everywhere and those programs are getting shut down in a lot of universities and a lot of institutions so even um it's not even available for those classes in many ways that even if you want to take those classes if you're a science student um chances are that you you might not take those and I think that blaming science is a misdirection of, of ire because it's more the business model 
Mm -hmm. and the bottom line that is doing this, then scientists are not making these decisions. It is not science departments who are defunding. It no. is the Arizona legislature in our own state that is defunding as much as they can of anything that isn't of you know, certain values that are favored. Mm -hmm. And in, in generally in the United States, these defundings are coming from administrators who are trained on a business model and they are looking at where you know the big grants come from or what will help keep our institution even though it's a nonprofit supposedly so again i think it's it's rhetorical um, mm -hmm. smoke and mirrors to say that the science although all the anger is usually at look stem gets all the money i hear this over and over from people and i'm an english phd and i know you know from at least from some years ago it was always um, STEM itself that, act, for those who are not in the United States, it means science, technology, engineering, and math. And it's often used in public pronouncements that you know STEM gets a grant, this and that. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, science is more utilitarian than English, and then the humanities are tended to be perceived as being. And that's yeah that's what we can work on. But one thing we have to be aware of is that what's happening in STEM is affecting all of our lives. Mm -hmm. And whether you don't like science or not, these people are using it, mm -hmm. using it well or using it poorly. And in a lot of cases, I think it's the English majors who are you using the STEM abilities in bad right. ways. Well, this is this okay. Yeah. This is another. I didn't mean to cut you off there, Nancy. But one thing we could do is the costs and benefits. Everyone, look in your own life. What in science do you think has hurt you? Now, make a list of what may have saved your life that comes from science, or that you might not be still around <laughs> if it weren't. Well, I think most of us are still around. <laughs> mm. Some are stronger than others because of what science has done in the last 50, 80 years. It's just uh, amazing how it's changed things. But you mm -hmm. see how doing a cost and, and cost and benefits takes away that good, bad, two value thing. Mm -hmm. You're making a list. And, well, and it's sort of like blue, red in our country. Nobody's blue, mm -hmm. nobody's red. You have to be willing to discuss things and, and see what the merits are. And okay. I don't think people fall into just categories. And I don't think I do. There are Especially, and who has access to those? Um, uh, scientific inventions, right, or medical inventions, who has health insurance, who has uh, all those resources that they can afford having that. Mm -hmm. In a lot of um, um, states and a lot of um, uh, counties, people have no health insurance and they cannot benefit from this. Uh, and it's basically science for everyone. Be It's replaced by science for people who can afford it. Or right. science is that is that a function of science itself? Think about it. Or is it a function of the capitalist system that means you can have mm -hmm. all the science you can afford mm -hmm. under capitalism? And that's why it's so important to acknowledge that science is not neutral. It's not objective. It's a political, um, like everything else, is political. And and it's it's not that scientists do work in a lab. They go home and their inventions are out, and everybody has access to it. But it's a little bit more complicated, right? And and I think um, in many ways at ASU they try to infuse these programs together. So now arts and STEM they are together. So you take arts classes and humanities are taken like ethics and and mm -hmm. uh, um, literature and science fiction and so forth. So they try mm -hmm. to infuse these two, um, but. I generally agree that, that we could do much better <laughs> to make sure. I think they would read other than one novel if they're reading science fiction. I remember when I was in grad mm -hmm. school, they only taught Frankenstein. That was the only science fiction. Mm -hmm. And it has this very negative kind of, you know, mm -hmm. containment theory of science. And there are many other great novels. Mm -hmm. Like Isaac Asimov wrote a novel called, mm -hmm. I mean, a short story called Nightfall that mm -hmm. simply goes into a whole different planet and uh, structure where there are multiple suns and then they're they're going to have mm -hmm. night nobody knows what that is and he shows how the religious group tries to understand it and how the scientists do mm -hmm. 
And it's a great story. It's considered one of the best ever. And mm -hmm. it's just taking the two positions. It's not condemning either one. Mm -hmm. It's not binary. And yet we teach Frankenstein. So mm -hmm. that's, I would add, if you're doing more programs on these kinds of things, Peter, consider Isaac Asimov's Nightfall. Mm -hmm. A very more costs than benefits. And the man was only 21 when he wrote it. And it's amazing. Yeah, and it's still a great, yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, so I think that uh, we're we're going to get there to some kind of a new understanding. And I was happy to see the areas of common ground coming in mm -hmm. when I was in school, but I was very um, concerned by the, the hostility that was going on, oh. at least at our college during the period I was getting my PhD around 2004 between College of Sciences, mm -hmm. STEM, which was a bad word in English. And, you know, and, and I would have students, I taught scientific writing for at least two semesters and, some, and they were seniors. And some of my students were engineering students and others were taking it to broaden out if they wanted to be English teachers. And the science people would say they didn't like writing classes because it was so fuzzy. Mm -hmm. They wanted one stated problem and they could come to the right answer. And, and it was, that was the teaching challenge then to try to help them to understand why sometimes it isn't one thing that's correct. And mm -hmm. that it's a whole world view. And if we, if we just start shooting arrows across boundaries, which I think all these reincarnations mm -hmm. of Frankenstein's are, are doing, you're not saying, hey, maybe we should try to understand the worldview and how those people understand things. And that would be very useful. And then if you, you know, you can still criticize across, mm -hmm. but you wouldn't be saying we have to get rid of it all. There was one book called Whose Science Is It Anyway? Mm -hmm. by Sandra Harding. It came out, I mm -hmm. think, in the 1980s or 90s. And pretty much she just said feminism says we have to we have to scrap scientific method. No wonder it didn't get further. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think it got very far. In the English departments, it was read all over the country. It was very, very influential. And it's just that mm -hmm. um, you know, people don't name their sources, but they come to mm -hmm. meetings and then they join women, you know, join the voting groups and voting things and people vote so mm -hmm. um, you know it's it, it is interesting so that's another good book whose science is it anyway anyway does she really does she adequately really? balance the costs and benefits of the scientific method and i i consider myself a feminist although this is one of the most problematic areas for me is the um where they're starting to actually say that uh, science, which, you know, when you use an abstract, science is so patriarchal, and then she'll go mm. through 10 chapters showing how it is patriarchal. There's no hope. We need to think intuitively and with empathy and ethics. And all of these are assumed, you know, she's given examples of bad behavior do not exist in science as it is currently practiced. These, these kinds of um, strong cases need to be examined because of the moral high ground that they try to take. Whereas um, sometimes it's through the sciences and technology that very poor people get educated. Mm -hmm. And people don't recognize that because the humanities are a top-down creation of knowledge. And I don't want to take up too much time, but I have a real fast thing I used to use on my, my grad student pals in grad school. And they would say, oh, you know, humanities is the one that empowers the people and everything. And I give them this example, although because science does change over time, it has been overturned. Clyde Tombaugh in the late 20s and early 30s up at Flagstaff Lowell Observatory thought there were nine planets at Yale and Harvard and all the elite schools, the people who, he wasn't even a PhD yet. He was just almost a PhD at Lowell Observatory. And he used his data, it was sent to all these places. They had to admit, yes, it appears there are nine planets. I contrast that with um, Harold Bloom who would have one interpretation of Hamlet. And you could be Clyde Tomblow in 
at NAU and say, well, I think, you know, Hamlet means this and this. Because it's top down and it's very affected by status in the humanities and there's no numeric or statistical mm -hmm. counterbalance, Harold Bloom will be right every time. Nobody will believe a person from NAU and his interpretation mm -hmm. of Hamlet over the man at Yale or Harvard. Mm -hmm. That's because in science, it doesn't matter who you are. You could be a mm -hmm. nobody. And if mm -hmm. your data shows that there are nine planets, Harvard and Yale had to say, well, for <laughs> many years until we got better data, it appears there's nine planets. We can't argue against it. Harold Bloom would never be wrong. That's the difference. And that is never given. And there are many examples in science where I call it credentialism comes in and, and fuzzes the data and makes it less. But that's a big difference. Humanities is totally ruled by name uh, value of what university. And yeah. there's no effective counterbalance like numbers. That's why I was trying to bring uh, computer studies of Dracula into and it was published in an MLA journal uh, because I felt that if you could do a computer study of a text, it wouldn't matter if you were at Harvard or if you were here at the University of Arizona. If your study was valid and they couldn't make better evidence, then. So you see, there, there are even more dimensions of this humanities and sciences thing. So any other what do you think of that? I mean, does that hold water to you, Peter? That kind of a mm -hmm. top-down? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And then I just took some notes, and also I will read this book. Um, and I gotta go. I'm, I'm unfortunately, okay. but I'll I'm, send you my, I'll send you my article you. on Dracula. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Assisted. Okay. Thank you. It's great. Thank, thank you, you so much thank for the discussion. You so much, Peter. Of course. And thank you for having please, me. And, and please come back, so you know, in about half a year, you know, into the next year, if you will, because we'll have some new data then. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I, okay. I would love to. Thank you so much again. Have a thank day. you. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Well, everybody, I'm going to, you know, do you have any more comments or final anything, Nancy? Nope, it was very good. Okay, well, I'm glad you liked it. And now it's going to go up <laughs> on, <laughs> on our YouTube channel for the world. Okay, I'll see you later then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, I should, I, I know what I'm going to do. Wait, no, cancel, cancel. And stop recording. Yes, see what that does. <laughs>